And what is the dream? First, it is the burning idea of liberty, of free men governing themselves. And second, it is the promise that in such a climate of freedom, men can build a more productive society, one which will bring the greatest benefit to the greatest number. Such is the boldness of which the American dream is made. All of that's out of the window now. The deal that said, work hard, get a lot of stuff, is now work hard, get into debt. Young people today are facing a completely different reality. Change is inevitable now, and it's gonna happen at a much faster rate than we've ever been used to before. What values will replace the American dream? For generations, those living in and coming to North America have been inspired by an ideal. In many ways, this ideal is framed in the famous line of the United States Constitution, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1931, James Adams, in his book, The Epic of America, coined the term, the American dream, to describe this promise of a better, richer, and happier life for all citizens of every rank. Of course, in fact, there were cruel societal barriers to education and advancement for minorities. But in spite of these, even though severely restricted, many could still rise with the tide of new possibilities of security and stability for their families. Well, the American dream is based on possibility and dignity. The possibility part is that you could come from someplace else, and if you just showed up, did what you were told, did it with earnestness, did it with consistency, you would get ahead, and your kids would get even further ahead. And what that promised, in addition to being able to take care of your family, was the dignity that came from being respected in your community, because we decided not to measure who your parents were, not to measure so much what you looked like, but to measure how much you got paid. And so there was this path to get from where you were to where you wanted to be. That was the promise. But it's essential to understand what the fuel was. 75 years of the Industrial Revolution paying dividends. Organized production in the United States was so profitable that we had a shortage of workers who could do the work. So if you just got on the train, you were gonna make it because that engine kept pushing it forward. But after the Second World War, the goal of the American dream began to shift. In the U.S., returning veterans received low-interest mortgages with no down payment required. This made home ownership the new norm. The car became widely affordable, allowing a new living arrangement called the suburb to sprawl outward away from city centers. The GI Bill also provided tuition money for veterans to attend college. This profoundly changed expectations regarding university attendance. From 1940 to 1965, the number of U.S. adults completing four years of university had more than doubled. Prosperity seemed guaranteed. No one issued a written statement that said this is a promise. It was just built into the culture. And one of the toxic elements of it was the money part. People perceived that this was a race to amass the most stuff until the engine that fueled the whole thing started to run out of steam. Because then the only way to amass more stuff was to cheat, was to cut corners, was to moonlight and then have your spouse moonlight and then just pay attention to nothing but the stuff. By the time the pursuit of wealth had replaced the simple hope of a better life, the economic foundation on which it had all been based had developed serious cracks. I think we can trace it back to the container ship because the container ship completely revolutionizes geography. And that means that all of the dynamics that were in place that made being local important disappeared. And suddenly the whole world is your competition. Add to that the internet that shows up that now makes it so that all prices are transparent. That if you make average stuff for average people and you say to everyone, I'm the cheapest, you're in a race to the bottom. In 2008, the greatest recession since the 1930s touched the heart of North America at a profound level. 
As millions lost their family homes to foreclosure, unemployment soared. For the millennial generation, just entering the workforce, the American dream was like a bad check. Currently, 20% of all children in the U.S. live in poverty. America is one of the least upwardly mobile nations in the developed world. 60% of college graduates work in jobs that do not require a degree. The average household debt carried by American families is estimated to be $204,992. 54% of respondents in a recent poll said the American dream is unattainable. And over and over again, the promise was, it's okay, you'll get a job, you can pay off your debt in three years. It was a lie. That is why people are disillusioned, because they got sold, literally sold something that's fundamentally no longer true. While disillusionment with the American dream cuts across generations, the millennials, those born from the early 80s to the early 2000s, will have the most impact on framing the new ideal. Will the choice of careers be based around something other than maximum salary? What kind of companies will draw motivated employees? What will education look like? What will guide people's choice of home? What will form the millennial dream? We're seeing a shift in what people entering the workforce are looking for from their careers. It's a shift from, tell me what to do, and promise I can work here forever to listen to me, I think I know what to do, and this is a project, it's not my life. Why do I go to work? Under the American dream, careers were seen as the path to a better future. How is work changing, and what is it we want from our jobs? Deloitte conducted a global survey of the emerging workforce to get an accurate read. I think what we find more recently with respect to the millennial generation is there's definitely a solid work ethic, very strong work ethic, um, and much more networked kind of uh, generation. There's, uh, I think, less of a feeling that you're into a career employment type model. You would tend to look for some sense of accomplishment, more interested in job variety, opportunity to advance a skill, uh, potential to have an impact in an area that uh, is important to you with respect to your social view. I wouldn't want to suggest that that doesn't mean people are interested in you know, getting ahead or progressing or improving their living standard. But for sure, this feeling of an ability or a desire to contribute more broadly to society beyond the paycheck is absolutely real. For some, like Jennifer Starr, this desire for a job with more fulfillment is so strong that they actually leave high-paying positions for the world of nonprofit. Jen moved from corporate life to become director of partnerships for Free the Children. I spent the last 11 years in the HR outsourcing services industry, so doing everything from account management and sales to project management, operations. So decided that it was time for me to take all of the years of experience and the, the great opportunities I've had to develop my skills and take them into the not-for-profit sector. I spend you know, 50 or 60 hours a week at least working, and I was doing that previously as well. And so for me, um, at this point in my life, I wanted to make sure that that was fulfilling me. I knew that compensation would be different coming from the corporate environment, but there's so many other benefits to working for this organization. Um, I get to travel around the country when we have our We Day events and you know, get to go to dinners with talent and see incredible youth and in their speeches and, and just be so connected to what we're actually doing that those experiences more than make up for um, any kind of monetary change that I experienced. The leap and the jump is easier than people expect, it's worth taking the risk. The growing desire for more than just a paycheck, however, is not a choice open to all. Many students who have trained for a career path they thought would bring fulfillment find upon graduation that the game has changed. Ryan Porter thinks about this a lot. He runs Raise Your Flag, a startup that helps youth find work. He cautions that there is a dark side to the concept of meaningful jobs. The very first thing that I find and from our experience with young people that they're feeling 
is they feel like they've failed the system. And then we also have these people that go through university or college come out the other end without guaranteed work or without the prospect of work. And so what they start to do is say, well, if I can be broke doing this job, I might as well be broke doing a job that I love or that has purpose. And the way that everybody else interprets that is like, millennials care about jobs with purpose. Maybe some of them do, but some of them need to pay their cell phone bill last month, and they're just looking for work to do that. Helping young people find that first job and start a career path has given Ryan a clear picture of just how tough the job market has become. Even a low-wage fast food job will attract hundreds of applicants. In the past, the American dream was defined, and it was defined as you go to work, anyone can make it, work really hard, save for a house, save for a car, save for your family, and you'll be okay. And I think that all of that's out of the window now. Like Everything's been thrown out, and there's no definition. But I think that young people today are facing a completely different reality. One big change is that responsibility for standing out in the crowd falls entirely to the job seeker. Initiative and entrepreneurial spirit are the winning qualities. And so if you have an idea that you want to get into this industry or that you want to work with this employer, find out what kind of things you can be doing right now to make yourself stand out when your resume lands on the pile or your application comes through. You've put in some work, you've volunteered, you've taken this course, you've read this book, you've done this thing that now makes you a little bit more compelling than the person that just sent out 40 identical resumes on Indeed.com. The American dream was primarily focused on providing a better and more secure life for one's immediate family. Perhaps the scope in this new century has broadened out to society and the planet as a whole. Profit is still required, but in a totally new way, making a better society has become the purpose of our careers. If there is one place where the American dream seems to have failed on its promise, it is the expectation that a university degree leads to prosperity. The frustration is palpable for millennials, many of whom find themselves saddled with crushing student loans and degrees that have little market value. In the US, student loan debt is a staggering $1.2 trillion. That's an average of $27,000 per student. That has many students questioning the university degree. And yet, in the new world economy, education is vital. Is it the degree that is in question or the kind of degree? What kind of learning will be essential in the coming generation? We're calling the bluff of the people who said famous college, debt, do what you're told, number two pencils, standardized tests. That instead, education's more important now than ever before, but education needs to take two forms. One, how to solve interesting problems. And two, how to lead. The American dream provided basic universal education but the future will require personal skills as well as subject content. Education has been trying to disseminate a body of knowledge into a person that was useful for their, their future. And now students have a variety of futures that I can't predict. And there's no way that I can give them all the information that they need for the variety of paths that they're gonna follow. It becomes a question of how can I use my content that I'm required to teach to also teach other skills. So there's the amplifier, and that goes to there. There's a little wire going from here to the ground. Okay. Okay. To the, all right. That, and then you gotta... Fogarty agrees with Seth Godin's assessment that traditional teaching has failed to promote one of the most important skills needed for the new generation, entrepreneurial spirit. We have students often coming in from the earlier years where they are told to do this and what to do and when to do and how to do it. And eventually we kind of give them these broad questions and not necessarily tell them how to do things and say, well, I'm not really gonna help you out a whole lot other than to guide you. Maybe I'll give you a phone number of somebody I know who can help. And we can call somebody outside the classroom Eventually they start cluing in that they can call the minister of this and they can start using handles and talking to government officials and business people and we can go and get stuff and there's resources out there to, to work with and go outside the school. 
and it doesn't take very long if you're deliberate about it. So I think it's teachable, and there's lots of examples of students who have said, I have confidence now. I learned physics, but I learned confidence. But I learned how to network. I learned physics, but I learned how to collaborate and that I can make a change in the world. One example that I can think of, a student, her mom is an amputee, and she has a prosthetic leg. The student recognizes that there's lots of people out there who don't have. And so can she create a 3D printed prosthetic? Can she take it a step further and create a bioelectric arm? And instead of it costing thousands of dollars, can they have it cost a couple hundred dollars? So she worked really hard to learn not my content, because my content had nothing to do with coding, it had nothing to do with Arduinos. So she learned how to code. She took an EKG sensor and cut off the ends and stuck it to some muscles, found guitar strings and tied them together and created this arm that would move based on, on muscle, and all for you know a couple hundred dollars. It brought meaning to her learning, because she was doing it for some unknown person that was similar to her mom. Problem solving? Leadership, thoughtfulness, and entrepreneurial spirit will be the skills of the new workplace. Successful education will be where these are taught and encouraged. Universities need to respond to this new economy, and a lot of them are struggling. But there are a few that are taking leadership roles in figuring out how do we tackle some of these issues? How do we make change in a large institution where change is a challenge? There has been an explosion of online courses, but Karina LeBlanc still believes strongly in the irreplaceable value of the brick and mortar campus. Technology can allow us to connect in a way that we never have before, but there simply is nothing that can replace the magic of face-to-face -face communications and working in teams and groups to solve complex problems. Here at the University of New Brunswick, we have a great example of an organization called Resin Aerospace, which is a startup around big data where an engineering graduate and a business graduate co-founded and created this venture. They never would have met each other if they didn't sit in the same classroom together in these interdisciplinary experiential learning opportunities. Universities are the epicenter of innovation. They are where we are going to start the conversation about solving our most complex problems. They have access to world-class research and are surrounded by staff and faculty that want to see these students succeed in their futures. What's different now is that the student is in the driver's seat. It's no longer a prescribed, take this, do that, and you will get this job. It's a you must seek out the opportunities that allow you to figure out what it is that you want, what is your passion, and how are you going to get the skills you need to pursue your passion. All seem to agree it is vital that students take responsibility for their own education. The engine that once powered the American dream is now largely being built offshore. One indicator is the manufacturing sector. In 1965, manufacturing accounted for 53% of the U.S. economy. By 2004, it accounted for just 9%. But success in the new economy is less about the type of product or service being offered and more about why companies are in business in the first place. And even the giants of the past are re-examining the social and environmental impact of their operations. We are now in this post-industrial era where one of the jobs is clean up some of what the industrial era left behind in its rush to be cheap. And number two is figure out how to create meaning in what people do because we're not able to buy as much stuff either because we've bought it already, we don't have a place to put it, or we're out of money. In recent years, there has been significant growth in a new kind of company. Companies that have more than one bottom line. Profit is vital, but so are the planet and people. In a small Ontario farming town of 2000, Bowes Brewery is a prime example of a new economy company. 
Since opening nine years ago, Bose has experienced rocketing sales in the crowded craft beer market. Most of our customers start their relationship with us because they like the beer. But there's that moment where they turn from being customers into fans, and that's usually when they find out something really wonderful about us. Oh, it's organic. Oh, that's really cool. Oh, and you guys supported this charity that I really believe in. Oh, that's really cool. And oh, you're doing that initiative for the environment. It explains why we can grow by over 40% a year while having pretty much a zero dollar advertising budget. Word of mouth really only works if you give people something really cool to say. The bottom line for emerging companies is that making money is not the only goal. The idea of maximizing shareholder value being the only purpose for business just never really rang true to me. Don't get me wrong, if we can't keep the lights on, everything goes away. So it's important to focus on the first of the three bottom lines, but if that's all that you're doing, there's really, to my mind, no reason for you to exist. Positive social impact is the second bottom line. New economy companies view employees as team members who take on big responsibility, but are rewarded with high job satisfaction. We give people realistic but, but difficult objectives uh, and encourage them and give them the, the resources and the support they need to, to achieve them. And, and then it's up to them to, to make it happen. While it's very empowering, it's also, uh, for a lot of people, very scary. You know, if they've not been in that kind of work environment before. Our best type of worker is somebody that almost has an entrepreneurial type spirit, uh, somebody that can take their initiative. You need to get your job done and you are responsible for your deliverables, but at the same time, you don't feel crushing pressure on yourself by any means while you're working here. So you work hard because you want to work hard because you want the company to succeed. It's motivated workers colliding with a demanding but inspiring workplace. Bose was the first brewery in Canada to achieve B Corp status. B Corp is an association of triple bottom line companies that share this understanding that business must care for the environment, be a benefit to its employees, and be a positive social agent as it earns profit. People quite often ask, you know, how can you afford to do that? And you really reverse the question around is, if we weren't doing that, almost all of this wouldn't exist. And in a crowded marketplace where there's lots of great beer out there, having all of the extra things that we do is maybe that one extra reason someone buys our beer or one extra reason for them to talk about our beer to someone else. And all those one extra reasons really start adding up. Companies that do the right thing for the right reason tend to outperform everyone else. Rather than joining the race to the bottom or exalting profit above all else, B Corps and their like point the way toward a dream of a just society, a healthier planet, and maybe a better life. Where do I want to live? For decades, the global trend has been towards cities. But in recent years, city planners, demographers, and real estate agents have seen signs of a change, not from movement to the city, but away from that unique post-war invention, the modern suburb. The single-family suburban home with its white picket fence has been the archetype of the American dream. What is replacing it, and why? There was a tipping point, there was a point in time where those promises that suburbia offered didn't deliver. We'd been building cities a certain way and have refined and perfected it over hundreds of years and we completely turned our backs on it over the course of 20, 30 years. And not surprisingly, it doesn't work. Cities have been messy and chaotic but there was an underlying wisdom to them, and that wisdom gave them their character. It's a city that was really about proximity. Compact, walkable, fine-grained in terms of its block and street pattern, and so everything was human-scaled, as they call it. 
Most amenities and services and uh, shops and places of residence, places of work were often within walking distances. The entire city was really one that was designed and measured to that of, of the human being. We have places like Paris, which some would consider the most civilized, dense city in the first world. I mean, roughly 29,000 people per square kilometer, far more dense than even Manhattan. People living in multiple unit buildings, roughly six to eight stories in, in height. Not a lot of private space, not even a lot of outdoor private space, almost none to speak of, but splendid, commonly shared public spaces. While there has always been housing on the edges of the world's great cities, the North American suburb was not a natural extension, but a soulless aberration. In the post-war era, what we saw in North American cities was complete transformation. The suburban dream. Your own single detached house in the countryside, near the greenery, accessed by car, in amongst neighbors like yourselves. Virtually and in reality, uh, you couldn't tell them apart. You could be dropped in one part of North America and thousands of miles away in another part of North America and you wouldn't know the difference. They were placeless places. The unanticipated result of the suburb was social deterioration at the heart of cities. Some people talk about the donut effect, the kind of leaving behind of, of the uh, underclass or the lower class at the time in, in the inner cities resulted in a stigmatization across a whole range of social dimensions. The American-style suburb is not likely to disappear quickly, but realtors have been noting a swing back to living downtown again. When you look at where millennials are choosing to live, they are drawn to what are best examples of our refined urban developments, which are the old traditional neighborhoods within walking distance of schools and in a vibrant main street that has all the services and amenities that you'd want, many of them in ma and pa type stores. It's about not wasting time commuting. It's about affordability, being close to your peers and your community. And that's why we see the downtowns across North America in a renaissance right now. Toronto, very much symptomatic of that. Uh, the downtown is growing at four times the rate of the rest of the city. Thousands of new units are being added and there's no end in sight. We've come 360. In many ways, there is a rejection of our parents' sense of success and a kind of return back to kind of more traditional ways of living in the city. What are the housing options for urban living? What is happening as a result of the increased interest in urban neighborhoods? What choices face recent graduates who are often burdened by debt? The average price of a detached home in Toronto now, I think, is around 1.2 million. That's increasingly becoming unaffordable for a lot of people. You can get a three-bedroom condo for far less than that. So I think you'll start to see people make those trade-offs. You know, it's a smaller place in the city, it's, it's more affordable now, and I'm gonna make that decision. For cities like Toronto, condos are the entry point to home ownership for many, but increasingly they are a lifestyle choice as well. I think there's this fixation that you, you need to be a homeowner. It's this rite of passage, it's the way that you climb the socioeconomic ladder, but that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of other countries that don't have the same home ownership rates. And these are really wealthy countries. Germany, Switzerland, these are, these are rich countries. You can have a country, you can have a place where most people, or the majority, rents, and you can still do you know, economically well. Where home ownership was once viewed as security, it is coming to be viewed by some as a burden. I've spoken to people who are, you know, wealthy professionals that could very easily buy, buy homes, you know, doctors, lawyers, etc., and they're, and they're renting, and they're fine with that. People value experiences over material things. There's a mindset that I'd like to be able to shut my door and go travel for, for a month if I want to and not worry about maintenance and, and, and looking after my property and all those types of things. So there's a freedom element. Previous generations were so set on owning all of these things and it almost kind of ties you down and restricts you and it doesn't, it doesn't liberate you in the same way. It was the car that gave birth to the suburb. But with a return to the downtown, many are abandoning car ownership for economic, convenience, fitness, 
and environmental reasons. I know for me, I, I hate driving. If, you know, if, I can, if I can avoid it, I, I do. And versus 15 years ago, growing up in the kind of suburbs of Toronto, you know, a car was like the biggest thing in the world. You know, getting your license and, and getting your own car was, was your, your ticket to freedom. Now it almost feels like a liability. Whether it's through renting, owning a condo, or buying a house, many are trading in the long commute by car and choosing the energy, culture, and proximity of downtown living. There will be a stronger kind of affinity towards center city neighborhoods for, for certainly the kind of younger generation that's kind of growing up and spending their kind of young professional years in, in the city. City planners agree that it is not size that increasingly attracts people to city centers, but the vibrancy, proximity, and arts and culture that are part of the urban experience. The marketplace is now completely globalized. It is no more difficult to purchase a product or service from another country than it is from across town. Originally, the American dream emphasized building quality products and providing reliable service. But over decades, it became a pursuit of the lowest price. Now, North American consumers are increasingly concerned about quality and the social impact of their shopping choices. More people want to know the background to products on the shelf. There is a growing desire for a personal connection to the products and services we use. Nowhere is this seen more clearly than around our food supply. Less than two generations ago, 97% of the food we ate in our community was grown also by the community within an hour's distance. And then we moved into a supermarket system where we get disconnected from the story of where our food was made and how. People are just now realizing that there should be a story. In 2010, Chef Levi Lawrence moved back to his home in New Brunswick, Canada to start Real Food Connections. The idea was to make fresh, locally grown farm market style food more available to local restaurants, hotels, and shoppers. He operates a grocery store, an industrial kitchen, a wholesale delivery service, and has developed a network of over 120 local food producers, mostly small-scale farms. Every day, Levi sees people's hunger to be more informed about what they eat. With the access to information you have on your phones and on the internet, uh, you can find out more about how your TV's made than the food you buy at a grocery store. And you see that revolt amongst the youth now that, that feel they should be able to know how their food's being grown because it's something they know that grows in a local farm, um, but yet they're buying their carrots from Jerusalem and they don't know who picked it and what the life conditions were. Generally, what we've promised our customer is that we're going to find an authentic business with a story from New Brunswick. We can tell you who made it, where it was made, and how. We guarantee the authenticity and the transparency. Because of the personal connection, Levi can vouch for environmental and humane practices on the part of the farmers. You get into animals and meat, and it becomes a very serious conversation, a very complex one. We have a saying in our store that all of the local meat we buy all had one great life and one bad day. People are just looking to replace complexity and risk and danger and unknown with a story they can relate to, with communities and, and geography that they can relate to. Why would you not buy it local? It's often less expensive. You can connect and, and have that assurance of quality because you can meet the farmer. Giving control of your financial decision about where your money goes and how much the farmer gets paid to a large international corporation, I don't think it's good for anybody's economy. I don't think there's any small community around the world that benefits from giving those decisions away. 98% of everything I sell in my store, I've paid a farmer. Wonderful. What have you brought me today? Just 
Jason Lejeune owns Isaac's Way restaurant in the city of Fredericton. Besides offering fresh local fare, the restaurant quietly goes about supporting local charities and promoting local producers. I think people want to feel good about their buying decisions now. So the independent restaurateur, the independent grocer, really can bring to the market a specialty local boutique product that the customer may not have experienced before. So we support the local cidery, craft beer producers. So when you buy a beer here, you can't buy a Bud Light, you can't buy a Corona, you can't buy a Guinness. We'll offer you good locally produced substitutes to that. But that's where the head of the market is at. It's been, we do those things out of uh, a wish to support those producers, but also that's where our customers are telling us that they want us to go. So we're trying to lead the market, but we're also following the market. Wherever makers do not have the economies of scale to compete for the lowest price, their greatest advantage may be their unique story and the story of their product. It is this that will win customers who are looking for personal connection. Predicting the future has always had a very low success rate, but these rising new values will almost certainly direct the coming decades. That is absolutely, I think, the future. I think that we are more and more looking to work with and to be employed by organizations that are making a difference in the world. And it's going to be driven by the students, by the citizens, who are demanding a difference in the way that they experience their education and in the way that they tap into a future job market that's completely unknown. As we do more things for the right reason, we seem to be rewarded with more sales. Young professionals, retirees, empty nesters are just really flooding back into the city. Um, and I think that's really the big shift that's, that's taking place right now. Cities that look to build vitality. Regions that wish to attract a vibrant workforce. Communities that want to produce well-being. All need to pay attention to these shifts. There are many traditional regions across North America that have witnessed an out-migration of the millennial generation. Reversing that gravitational force is fantastically difficult, but the concept is simple. Create a place people want to work and live. That's not limited to mega cities like New York or San Francisco. The growth of buoyant culture and the social capital that goes with it can happen even in smaller, second-tier cities, for it comes from something not dependent upon population alone. If somebody is curious, is editing Wikipedia, is blogging on a regular basis, is organizing meetups in their town, is figuring out how to weave together a fabric of community where money isn't the point, the more we see that, the more we're moving in the right direction. The hope will lie in making substantive changes in these critical areas. And what may help most is that these values are at the core of what makes us human.
American dream is a hidden path to unhappiness. Always running about money, 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 money. Part of the millennial dream is to make an impact, to make positive change. Having to do something that you enjoy is much more satisfying. We want to do what we love and we want to invest in our community. We all do find true fulfillment through helping others.